Hello, my name is Grace from the Grace Lake Public Library's Makerspace, The Hub. Now in this Take and Make Kit program, I am gonna introduce you to the popular art style called acrylic pouring. I'm gonna show you a few basic painting techniques that you can use to paint this square acrylic tissue box holder. Now acrylic pouring is a way to mix and manipulate fluid acrylic paints to create amazing abstract art. It's characterized by layers of mixed colors and patterns of open cells that almost resemble cells that you would find in nature. Most of my information came from David Voorhees at leftbrainedartist.com. He's an awesome resource. He goes into the science of how acrylic pouring works and gives you detailed tips and tutorials on many of the acrylic pouring techniques. Now, as I said before, I'm only giving you an introduction on acrylic pouring as a way of decorating this acrylic tissue box holder that we laser cut here in the hub. Please check out David's website if you would like to further investigate acrylic pouring. So let's get started. Okay, welcome back. Let's first talk about what is in your take and make kit and any additional supplies you need. Now, when you picked up your kit from the library, you should have received you know, a paper bag of supplies as well as a cardboard box. Now, the cardboard box will be your acrylic pour work area. This way you can contain all the messy paint. And also, if you're like me, my kitchen table is my craft space. So this way I can move the project somewhere else to completely dry when I need the table. You might also want to consider covering your box with a plastic sheet to catch the paint drippings. These drippings are called acrylic skins and crafters will often use them to make other crafts like jewelry or collages, but that's for another tutorial. Not to worry, if you don't have a box, you can also use another shallow container like an under the bed tote or even a large roasting pan. I mean, you, you actually don't even need a box. You can actually, you know, pour on your plastic um, protected surface. It's just that the box helps to contain the painting mess. Now, I got all these boxes at Aldi. Um, they usually have a wire cage in the aisle containing them. Produce boxes work well. Look for a box that is one piece across the bottom. That will be easier to keep your project level. Then, let's take a look at what's in our paper bag. First, there is your laser cut uh, tissue holder box that we cut in the hub. Now, I left the paper on, the backing paper on, to protect it from scratches. You will probably need to take the paper off when you glue your tissue holder box together. Okay. Okay, next, we have the paint. Um, you actually end up using quite a bit of paint in order to create the fluid mixing and layering in an acrylic pour. Now, I gave you three primary colors, as well as a as black and white, and a couple of, uh, of random craft paints that we had. You also have a picture of a color wheel, and we talk a little bit about color combos when we talk about mixing paint. Um, there should be enough paint for you to, you know, mix your own colors. All right. You also have a bag of clear liquid, which is our pouring medium. Pouring medium is a liquid additive that you add to the paint to extend the paint and make it fluid enough to pour. Now there are a lot of different pouring mediums out there, but we are gonna use one of the cheapest and easiest to find. We are using actually Elmer's glue wall or actually Elmer's clear glue. We are actually using the clear glue. Um, some acrylic artists prefer the glue wall. Some say it doesn't really matter if it's the clear or the white. We just happen to have a lot of the clear, so that's what we're going to use. Okay. All right, you have a variety of paper and plastic cups uh, in your kit. Now, the, the three ounce paper cups are what we're going to be using to mix uh, our colors, our paints in. Um, they're small, disposable, and uh, you can manipulate the cup easily to make a spout if you needed, you know, some precise pouring. You also have some four ounce plastic cups, 
which are intended to elevate your panels of the uh, of the tissue holder box. That way, when you pour the paints on the uh, panels, the paint will go over the edges instead of pooling underneath uh, the, the panel. Um, there are also four nine ounce plastic cups, and these are to be used when we layer the paint for the, uh, or the dirty pour technique that I'm gonna show you. And you have one large 16 ounce cup uh, to use to mix the pouring medium. Okay, there's a baggie in here that has wooden plastics. The short ones are to be used to, to mix the paint and the and the three ounce cups. And uh, the long ones we'll use to, um, you know, mix the pouring medium with. We're using <clears throat> the wide craft sticks because uh, my acrylic pour guru, David Voorhees, recommends them for correctly judging the consistency of uh, your paint. It's important that your paints have the same consistency, um, which is one of the keys to having a successful painting. Okay. You also have <clears throat> a small bottle of silicon oil. Silicon oil can be added to your paints in order to help create the multicolored bubbles and cells. You know, it's that basic concept of oil and water. So the oil is lighter and oil will rise up to the surface of the painting and push push away the water-based paint um, and create some of those uh, cool cells and lacing. The main go-to additive uh, for most acrylic pour artists is the silicon oil. And I found, you know, I found silicone oil at Michael's in the craft section under acrylic pouring. You can also order it online and the, one of the popular online uh, brands that they use is or types of silicon oil that they use is treadmill belt lubricant because it's 100% silicon. You can also use other silicon based <clears throat> oils like you know WD-40 or this you know three-in-one silicon oil. You can even actually try um, an additive like using isopropic alcohol in order to create these cells and lacing which are so popular with the acrylic pour style. Okay. All right, there's also, get these out of the way. There's also a clear sheet of acetate in your bag. Um, we're gonna use this acetate uh, for the swipe technique. And lastly, there are some, uh, there's a handout of uh, different pigment densities for golden paints. And we're gonna talk about pigment density and how it affects your acrylic pour when, we, um, when I show you the dirty pour and swipe techniques. A few other supplies that you might need. Vinyl gloves, and if you don't like to get paint all over your hands. So acrylic paint cleans up pretty easy with soap and water. Um, you're gonna need some glue to assemble the finished uh, tissue holder box. Now, they do have special glue for uh, acrylic panels. It's called um, Weld On 4. And what it does is chemically bonds the acrylic together. But you know, for what we're doing, it's not necessary. We can get away with using you know, some epoxy or the E60 or even some Gorilla Glue. Um, so I read you can also use hot glue to glue the acrylic together, you know, from maybe from the inside of the uh, tissue holder box. Um, super glue will work in a pinch but the, the chemicals in the glue will cause the acrylic to turn white. Though it really doesn't matter since we are painting the entire outside of the tissue holder box. Okay. All right. Now I would highly recommend you getting a digital kitchen scale. You can eyeball the proportions of paint to um, pouring medium. But the thing is, the more precise you are, 
you, the more you can guarantee that your paints will be consistent. And what's it's important to have consistent paint because you have that will give you a better chance of having a successful acrylic pour. You can use bottled or filtered water if the the paint is too thick and you need to thin it out a little bit. Um, you can, I mean, you can use tap water. It's just the tap water might have uh, bacteria or minerals or something in it that might contaminate uh, your colors over time. You need some glass cleaner to clean the acrylic panels before you pour the paint. And you know, and you can also need, as I said before, some protection for your work surface because you'll still get paint and pour medium over things. You're also going to need a small level. Um, your work surface and your panels need to be level so the paint does not just uh, roll off one side. One last optional item that, that a lot of acrylic pour artists will use is a kitchen butane torch, like the ones that you use for browning the tops of creme brulee. Now this is actually a heat gun from the library. Um, basically what happens is the heat breaks the surface tension of all the paint on your panels and allows the lighter density paint to rise and the heavier uh, paint to sink, which creates these beautiful effects of cells. And like I said, use of a heat source will pop air bubbles and allow the paint to flow more rapidly. And so we will have to play with to see how this works. You might want to watch the video first to familiarize yourself with all the steps and pick which technique you would like to use. You can even do some trial pours on some cardboard um, or heavy paper first. And you can also combine the different techniques or look up other ones on YouTube. Now, acrylic pour is all about trial and error. If it doesn't work out, you can scrape the paint off and try again. You can even pour over an old painting. As I said before, this is an introduction to acrylic pouring. As I did more research, it became apparent that there is a lot more to this acrylic pour style than I thought. So let's experiment together. Before we start mixing paints, we have to first mix our pouring medium. As you remember, pouring medium is the liquid additive that you add to the paint to extend the paint and make it fluid enough to pour for, for the acrylic pouring. I figured about a total of seven ounces of fluid to cover the uh, entire um, tissue box holder. Um, I'll probably uh, error on the um, a little extra paint. It's a little bit better to have extra paint than too little paint. Though there are fixes for that. If you run out of paint, you could actually add a, a solid color to the edges to, to, to cover um, the whole surface. Okay, so if we're going to need about seven ounces of paint, and let's say we go up uh, a little extra and go to eight ounces. So if we're doing a one-to-one -one ratio of pouring medium to paint, we would all would need about a total of... Um, uh, four ounces of uh, pouring medium, right? So four ounces times 70% is about 2.8 ounces of the glue. So let's see, change this to ounces. Enough glue here. Yeah. Oops. Oh. Okay, well, oops, I went up to like <laughs> three ounces by accident. I'm not gonna worry about it too much. So then I put enough water in here to make it a little over four ounces. All right, that'll work. And go ahead and mix that. Mix slowly and make sure that you scrape the sides down and incorporate. Uh, the glue and the water um, equally. I wanted to give you some basic color theory to help you pick your colors for your pour and hopefully avoid muddy colors. Um, but there's been many a successful pour using random colors. So experiment and remember that you can always pour over a painting that didn't work. But if we take a look at uh, the, the basic color wheel, you'll see that primary colors are red, yellow, blue, 
Um, your secondary colors are orange, green, green, and purple, and these are created by by combining two of the primary colors. You have tertiary colors, which are created by mixing a secondary color with the primary color. So you get colors like yellow, green, blue, green, you know, blue, purple, red, purple. Okay, so then this half of the color wheel is uh, are the warm colors, and they're usually associated with feelings of excitement to rage. Um, and they work really well with neutral colors in browns and blacks. Um, this half of the color wheel from purple to green are the cool colors. And cool colors are, can be uh, give feelings of peaceful and, and they can be soothing. Now, some terminology, a hue is the color family in its purest form, like, you know, red and yellow, blue, green, orange, and purple. Uh, now, a tint is taking one of these hues and mixing it with white. Usually it's used to lighten a hue. Um, a tone um, is, um, is to mix a hue with a gray, uh, and it's usually the duller color or to you know, reduce the saturation. And then a shade is when you mix one of these hues with black to, to darken the hue. Now there's some basic color schemes, um, like tried and true, um, to base uh, colors of your painting with. Uh, one of the basic schemes are like a monochrome color scheme and those are colors that are like in the same color family like for instance you know multiple shades of blue see you know here's a tint you know going to the pure colors um, now complementary are colors opposite each other so they're direct opposites and they're they're high contrast colors and they make a bold statement so like you know purple its complementary color is yellow and then red is is green another basic color scheme are the analogous and these are colors next to each other on the color wheel like for example the blue green the green and the yellow green uh, another one is called the triadic and those are three colors that are equal distance away from each other um, like for instance actually the primary colors is a triadic as well as the secondary colors or we can go like from yellow green to orange red to blue purple and they're less contrast than complementary colors um, but they do work well together. Color combination I want to talk about is called the split complementary. It's, uh, you know, you, you pick your main color, then it's the two neighbor colors of the complementary color. So it would be, say, yellow and the complement is purple, but in, instead it's this yellow and the red purple and the blue purple. So that's a split complementary. But anyway, I just wanted to give you some basic color schemes that you could um jump off of when you're deciding what kind of colors you want to use for your pour. Okay, it's time to mix our paint. Um, I like using a scale because it's a little bit more accurate and it's easier for me to gauge how much paint I have. Um, you can use you know, ounces or grams. If I'm use, making eight ounces of paint uh, and I'm using four colors, it's about uh, an ounce of um, pouring medium to an ounce of the color. So Let's make, do I have this on, change just the ounces, and I'm going to Okay, about an ounce, and I think I'm going to make some background white. Mix slowly and carefully. You know, making sure you scrape the sides and the bottom and actually the stick to, to make sure that the color and the, uh, or the, the paint and the uh, um, pouring medium have been um, carefully mixed or combined. With the ratios of one to one for the um, craft paint, you probably won't need to add any water to thin this out. Actually, it's actually kind of thin, so I'm gonna add a little bit more pigment to this.
Okay, mix slowly, you know, scraping your bottoms and your sides and scrape your stick. And I actually ended up having to add a little more glue and more, a little more pigment to this because it was still a little too thin. Another thing you could do if it's too thin is you can let it sit and evaporate. But I'm holding up my stick about 30 degrees, about two inches above the surface. And you can see that the paint is dribbling and leaving a little mound, kind of like a little ice cream cone. And it takes, you know, like about three seconds for it to dissolve. That's a pretty good regular pour. And what's important is that, you know, you're looking at the consistency that you've got here, right? You want to make sure your other paints match this particular, your particular, whatever particular consistency you get, whether it's, you know, a little left or set or, or right of the average consistency, but it's, um, you know, go ahead and mix your other paints. And, and as I said, try to keep your paints consistent to the each other. Okay, once you have all your paints mixed, um, it's time to pour. Here's my box, and I've actually lined it with a bit of plastic because I want to see what happen what I can do with those uh, acrylic skins. I actually ended up let's see my colors. Where's the white and white. I actually ended up going with that uh, split complementary color scheme with the, the purple and then like a orange yellow and a yellow green. And then I also have white from a background color. So let's put this over here. And I have my cups. And I already cleaned my uh, panels with glass cleaner. And actually, the first thing I'm gonna do is put a thin film of white paint on the panel, which will give um, a little background for the colors to flow around, if that makes sense. Um, on canvas, it, it's not as apparent on a piece of slick plexi, but if we were doing this on canvas, um, canvas has tooth and that slows down your paint. Um, so if you put a, a, a thin coat of white paint on it, that aids in the fluid movement of the paint. Okay, so let's see. If I pour, and actually these have been sitting for a little, my paints have been sitting for a little while, which actually is good because it helps, uh, then, then the paint's kind of uh, melding with the um, pouring medium. So you, you wanted to give it another stir, scrape it around. And I think I'm gonna try just pouring a little, some of this on here and see if I can. There's a couple of ways, I've seen a, a couple of ways people do this. You know, people will use a comb or a card or they're also, We'll just try to um, can tilt it around to see if you can get the thin film on. Let's see if see if we can do this. <laughs> yeah, I don't think I had enough paint on here. So maybe, maybe if I let's see if I could spread this around here. Yeah, I just want a little bit of, yeah, just a little skin of the white here. And actually this, this, I forgot to mention this, this first technique I'm showing you is what they call a traditional pour. And it's the most basic technique. And we've mixed our paints in separate containers. And then what we're going to do is pour um, the paints separately, color by color, um, 
on the canvas or on the on the panel and then we've already laid down a thin layer of white paint to give it something to flow on so i can pour the paint on here in uh, a random pattern or i could pour it in recognizable shapes um i could actually you know sprinkle the paint you know on with my stick or with a spoon and so i think we're just gonna go for this um let's see You see what I mean about using a lot of paint? <laughs> and then I'm going to pick this panel up and tilt it around. Now with um, traditional pour, it's more of a solid uh, color. So I'm going to tilt this because I want some of this paint. And actually, I don't like the fact there's so much of this green. So I might just see if I could slide some of that off. Actually, I think I might go back. Actually, toss a little more, break up some of that space with the. And one of the hallmarks of this paint style is it, nothing is really wrong. You, you know, you can it's it's very um, trial and error, impromptu, and, and experimental. I'm going to not mess with that anymore. And actually, it's going to continue to flow. Oh, and I forgot to show you. Um, I did check the levelness of my table before I started pouring. But uh, you might want to remember to do that. Um, yeah, this is pretty level. So you want to check to do that um, before you start pouring. So that's kind of interesting. And I'm not sure I like it. But not to worry, if you don't like it, you can always let it dry um, and, you know, pour over it again. What's nice about these cups is you can form a spout to get a little bit more of a precise pouring. Now, as you can tell, with so much paint on the surface, it's going to take a little while to dry, a couple days to dry completely. And after it dries, you might also want to coat it with a little polyacrylic, which will help protect it, the, uh, the paint from scratching off, especially on the acrylic. It's pretty wild. I think I'm getting to the point where I'm playing around too much with this one. Yeah, I think I'm playing around. 
now with this one too much. I should just leave it alone. All right, that looks a little bit more like that. Pro you could probably move these aside and, and do the other panels on this side. Hello again. This next technique I would like to show you is called a dirty pour. And this is a little different from a traditional pour, but it's similar. And actually, I think for this pour, we're going to add some of our silicone to in encourage uh, the formation of the cells. Um, you would only need about a drop of silicon in about two ounces of fluid. Um, these are old little um essential oil bottles that I had and unfortunately the little stoppers uh, the little holes in here are too fine the uh, the silicon oil is too uh, thick and won't go through it so what you're gonna have to do is 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 take the lid and kind of pry off the stopper carefully put you know a droplet of oil in your paints or if you have a pipette you know, or even a syringe if you want to use that. And then 
bee stopper, my my um, silicon oil. And then you're gonna gently, and actually, if you gently fold the oil in, you break the oil up less and so you're more liable to get larger cells. If you want smaller cells, um, stir faster and that breaks the oil up into smaller little bubbles because it, it basically the concept is that oil is lighter than uh, than the paint and will rise to the surface and as it rises to the surface it um, you know basically goes through the layers of paint and pushes them aside so that's where you're going to get these you know very uh, multicolored looking cells which are really um, uh, sought after and very interesting and beautiful to look at. So, okay. Now, what the difference between a dirty pour and a regular conventional pour is that, or traditional pour, is that you will mix all of your colors in in a, one cup. Basically, you pour you're going to pour all these different colors in one cup, and this is where uh, the concept of uh, density of your paints becomes a factor. Now, when you take a look at these reference sheets that I have here, this is this is for golden. Uh, uh, this is a, a reference sheet from Golden Artist Colors. So this is like a, an approximation, and they list all pigments sorted lightest to heaviest. And 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 paint pigments can be uh, minerals or plants or or, or variety of um, different substances to make the color. Um, but for instance, like, usually your white and your black, you know, this is that made out of titanium is, is, is going to be heaviest. So it's like a 3.9 on this, uh, density scale. And then the Mars black is actually heavier and that's about a 4.6 in, in, and the, and the rest of these like are, um, this is like the lightest. And then these are like medium rains. And what it is, is that. The heavier a color is, it's going to sink. And the lighter the color is, obviously, will float to the top. Okay. Okay. So pouring all your paints in a single cup means that your colors mix inside the cup, making more colors. And how you layer the colors affects the way that it comes out. So I'm going to pour a little bit of white in the bottom here, like I'm, I'm, I'm white on the bottom on one side here. And then I'm going to pour a little bit of this this purple. And you can see, you can see that the purple is just sitting on top of the white. And that's because the density of the purple paint is lighter. How you layer um, your colors affects the way that they come out. If I pour some of the black, okay, actually I'm gonna pour, let's pour a little bit of, of the green. And you can see that that sits on top too, right? Now, if I pour the black, since it's heavier, it's gonna go straight through. You can see that it hasn't enlarged or settled out. It's just kind of going straight through because it's heavier and mixing into the colors underneath it. And you can see that the, the black hasn't um, spread out. It's just kind of contained. So you can get around this sinking um, by pouring slowly or pouring paint along the sides. Now, according to David Voorhees, understanding this concept can help you predict how your colors will come out. Now, I don't have enough experience with acrylic pouring to really understand this, but this is where we're all learning together. So I'm gonna go ahead and just, let's see, pour some of this lighter purple in here. And maybe hit another little bit of a white as I'm, as I'm layering my paints. And I, I, I poured the white along the side because it's heavier and will have a tendency to sink and I want it to, to sit on top of the paints. Sink right through. Let's try. A little 
black right through the center of that. And see, if, since I'm pouring it very slowly, the black is sitting on top of the, uh, the other paints. And it'll be very interesting. This is going to be very interesting to see what this turns out like. Because as the heavier paint sinks and mixes up, mixes with the paint underneath it, and as the lighter paints rise, they do the opposite, mix, you know, with the colors and, and above it. And as, as David Voorhees says, I guess once you get um, experience with this, it could, you can use this to help predict um, how this is going to look out. And also, uh, the, using the different densities of paint could allow you to um, make those cells without necessarily putting in any additive to it. Which paint is this? Let's make this two. Because if I make this two ounces, I could probably, two, two and a half ounces, I could probably pour two panels. Because that way I could show you uh, two different ways of, of actually maybe pouring the, uh, the dirty cup. Now, for this panel, I am going to take my dirty pour and actually drizzle half of this paint across the panel. And then I'm going to tilt this until I can get the entire... Um, surface covered with paint and you can actually see some really interesting structures And I'm kind of like in this dark section, it's kind of like acting like a focal point. I think I should have put a little bit on the corners to help it flow out. I'm gonna use a little bit of paint to do on the edges. So, so that's kind of an interesting, it's gonna be much more marbled. Now, at this point, this is where you can use your heat source to get rid of some of these air bubbles, as well as bring out some additional cells. This so is basically what your heat source is doing. Oh, that's weird. Oh, it is bringing out the bubbles. You can see them start to come up. Oh, that's actually really cool. And actually, this is kind of like, this heat gun is kind of like a little teeny tiny little hair dryer. But, but look, you can see the some of these cells developing in this dark area, which is really kind of cool. And that's due to the silicon. Because what the heat does is it, it breaks the surface tension is what it is. It breaks the surface tension of the paint and allows the uh, silicon to come up 
and also for the paint to flow better. So it's kind of interesting. So you can see some more of those uh, cool looking cells. Okay, on the second panel, I'm just going to take the remnants of my dirty pour and just actually just pour it down the center. And I guess as you <laughs> do this more often, you can guess how much paint, because actually I think I poured a little too much. Well, maybe not a little much paste, but see, look, isn't this kind of interesting? Since I poured it from the center, there's this kind of a rings feel going on. And actually, yeah, I think there's a some validity of coat in the corners because they do seem to not want to. But total, random, abstract patterns, you know, generated by the way you pour paint. <laughs> now, as you can, I think you can tell that there's a quite a heavy layer of paint on here. And you also see why having a pour box is handy because you are moving around a lot of paint and you need a lot of paint to be able to get these cool effects. And actually, I'm going to put this one down now because I kind of like the way how different this is to this one. You know, and as it dries, the paint's going to continue to move over the edges. And I'm going to go ahead and Hit this one, this uh, panel with the heat gun too. And look, you can see the yellow blooming. And this is, this is what is um, a very typical look for an acrylic pour. Actually, I don't think I want to do too many of these cells, but that is super cool. The last technique I'm going to show you uses the um, acetate sheets that I gave you. And I actually cut the largest sheet in half to make it just a little easier to handle. Um, but with the swipe technique, what we're going to be doing is laying down bands of color and then taking uh, one of the heavier colors, like the black or the white, and then swiping it over the top of the, um, the rest of the colors. And because the paints are thinner, you're going to get these large cells. The consistency of the paint, what you want is that it's it's thinner and when you drop it for about an inch, it just kind of like drizzles down and, and disappears. That's kind of how thin you want the paint. Okay, and, and if and I'm using the old, you know, I'm using the paint that I already had, that I thinned it down to, to make it the right consistency. But if you were gonna mix this from scratch, uh, the pouring medium is about 60% glue to 40% water. And then when you mix the paints, it, uh, the paints would be one part paint to two parts of the pore medium. All of this information is on uh, David Voorhees' website, um, leftbrainedartist.com. I, I can't emphasize how helpful um, he was with his methodical scientific way of, of, of breaking down uh, acrylic pouring to make it easier for us beginners to, uh, to, to make some really cool things. So... I'm gonna go ahead and thin these paints out. And the way I am thinning these out is actually just adding some more um, pouring medium to my colors and and visually, you know, mix them in and, 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 and testing the consistency to see if it's correct. Yeah, actually this could be a little thinner. 
you know, as I said before, if you're making these colors from scratch, you can follow the formula. But since these are already existing colors, I'm just going to go ahead and add some more uh, pouring medium to my colors to make them a little thinner. You don't want to waste your paint. Yeah, that's good. See, that kind of immediately disappears. That's good. So now what we're going to do is lay our color in uh, colored stripes. And actually I have, I still have a little bit of this dirty pour that I might actually just pour as one of the stripes. So let's start, let's start with the green. Okay. Now, since we, this is the paint we used for the dirty pour, and it has the silicone in it. So let's do green now. And I just want to make sure that all the edges are, you know, the whole surface is covered. And that's a little too much green over there. Okay. Then what you do is take that top swipe color. And I'm in my case, I'm going to use the black and pour about an inch, half inch, inch um, stripe and where you want to start your pour. And you could start your pour like in the middle, at the top, on an angle. It's up to you, um, something to play with. But I'm gonna, I'm gonna just, let's paint. And so basically what we want to do is pull this thin layer of black paint over the top of the rest of the uh, color. So I'm going to grab my, I don't know, can you see this acetate? And I'm just going to lay it, the edge, on top and very gently, carefully, lightly swipe that black color and I'm starting to think I'm thinking that yeah see I'm thinking that my uh, um acetate sheet was a little heavy because look I, I took off a lot of the layer of paint um but you can start to see some of the um cells forming and actually he was David was saying if you don't like the way it looks you can take the swipe and go in the opposite direction. Let me turn this around. Um, and also, there's a variety of things that you can use for a swiping tool. And one of the very common ones is actually a damp paper towel. You, you dampen the edge and you, and you pull it down. And actually, I might just... Should I do that? Let me get one of those and, and we can see what that looks like. You, you want to dampen 
the edge, but not, you know, saturated. So that, cause you need the other half dry and then it's the, it's the like, like right on top. Yeah, see, I'm pulling off too much. Well, wait a minute. Yeah, I'm pulling off a lot of the paint, so I obviously need to practice this technique, but you can start to see the cells forming because the paint's so thin. So I'm actually going to go and grab my little heating gun again and hit it with a little, a little heat. You know, to pop the air bubbles as well as bring up some of the cells, but um, I pulled off, I could see I pulled off too much paint at the top, so I'm going to see if I could actually slide the paint up that way a little bit, because it's, though, you know, actually would be not too terribly, it would might, it might be kind of cool that it kind of fades to clear at the top. But see, these large cells, and I'm just picking some paint to cover some of these edges. Yeah, maybe. And the only thing is, you, gotta be, you know, you, you, you do end up distorting your cell, cell shape by moving the paint around. And oh, this is really cool. It's got this kind of psychedelic, like, 60s effect to this. So, yeah, definitely something I'm going to have to practice my delicacy because what's happening I wonder if I yeah because you can see it's like going to be clear up there which is kind of interesting I like what's happening down here with these like tight bunch of small cells and a large cell so maybe if I just and I suppose what I could do is actually Pour a little more paint up there. No, I wish I didn't do that. I think I liked it better when it was kind of streaked. But maybe if I hit it with a little more heat up there. Or actually, something you can also do with it thin, this is one of the techniques, is you can actually blow on the paint. Make it move where you want it to move. And I think I'm gonna hit, hit it with And actually, there's another technique that I've seen. I think it's called the Dutch pour, where they use hair dryers to move the paint around. And this, like, this, 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 this is heat gun is like that little mini hair dryer. around with that. I like the shapes of these cells. So maybe if I just took a little paint down there. Look at how cool you know the, the pour over is. You know there's a little acrylic skin so that might be fun to play with too. I have to save and put them away in a baggie. But now I'm going to show you how to assemble the uh, uh, tissue box holder.
Okay, guys, I wanted to show you how my panels um, turned out when they were dried. And I'm a little bit disappointed because the orange, and I think it had something with, with me probably um, doing too much tilting and agitating the panels too much because the, the orange and the green kind of melded together and got really muddy despite, you know, using a sanctioned or a, a, a common uh, color um treatment so I think though you know like for instance this top actually works better because you could see the orange and the green you know they're, they're more separate the colors are a little bit more separate and I think I just basically probably um played around with the uh tilting too much on these um other panels but oh well you live and learn um and and acrylic pour is all about experimentation and trying different things and learning different things. Um, and I'm still really, really new to this. So, you know, not surprising that I'll have a muddy pour, but, um, and if I had time, I would actually consider re-pouring this, but um, I, I need to show you guys, uh, glues together the, the tissue box. So I won't do that then. Okay. Once your tissue box holder panels are dry, you are gonna wanna peel off the paper backing and glue it together. And I decided I'm gonna see what uh, the hot glue does. Um, I'm, you know, I just, I'm just kind of curious to see how that will work on the acrylic. And also I wanna put this together kind of fast. <laughs> so I'm gonna try this, the hot glue. But uh, first off, I wanna peel off these, um, the paper on the um, panels. I mean, the paper actually helped the paint from curling over somewhat, but it's still curled over a little bit. Those are still not dry. Now, it takes about, you know, 20, any, depending on how thick your paint is, um, it could take 24, you know, to... 36 hours for the paint to dry on your panels um, and then you would want it to cure uh, sometimes it could take a week for it to fully you know dry all the way through and then I believe after that you will want to coat uh, the outside of your tissue holder box um, with some poly acrylic, which will protect the paint from scratching. fit tabs into slots. And it might be uh, the paint might make this a snug fit. And you might have to, you know, trim You know, some of the paint off of the gaps. This is the side half of the side.
actually what I'm going to use to hold uh, this box together while I glue it from the inside is put in a big rubber band to hold the outside of the box together. I don't, I don't want to use tape because that might pull the paint off. So that's the box. Actually, that's the bottom of it. Here's my top. If you notice, along the edges, it's clear, so you can actually see along inside. And I suppose what you could do is touch it up with some paint, but um, that was something to remember when we we're doing our acrylic pour, is to make sure you touch up the edges with some paint. Okay, I think if I turn this inside out... Then I could like lay a bead. You see that? If I could lay a bead of hot glue down the seams, you know, that'll keep it together. Well, it works, kind of. <laughs> it's just awkward to do. So maybe epoxy might be the better way to go. Because the, um, it's just kind of awkward to get into the, uh, the box to glue the ed uh, to, to glue the seams. But you get the idea. So glue it together with your favorite form of adhesive. Oops. Yeah. Hmm. Okay. One of the problems with the hot glue, it creates dimension and it might make it a little more difficult to get your tissue boxes in there. So I think in hindsight, or I would suggest actually going with an epoxy or some other uh, method of even super glue because the the um, hot glue works but it creates um, it makes it hard for you to get the tissue box in
And there we go. Our really cool acrylic pour tissue box holder. And yeah, I don't think I recommend the super glue. It just creates too much of a thickness, makes the walls of this too thick, and it makes it hard to get the uh, box in. So I would suggest actually you know, even using super glue or using one of the epoxies, but uh, I'm actually pleased with that. And I'm excited to see the other techniques I did as, you know, af after I do all the sides, that'll be fun to see. I hope that you enjoyed experimenting with the acrylic pour art style. There are literally hundreds of videos on YouTube with dozens of different techniques. What I appreciated most about the Left Brain Artist's website is his methodical and thorough approach to acrylic pouring. He did a lot of the groundwork and made it a lot easier to share this art style with you. Thank you everybody for your participation.